Today on the Changeville podcast, we're talking to David Bazan. David is a prolific songwriter who's been releasing music for over 20 years. He formed Pedro the Lion, a now legendary indie rock emo band that put out four albums and five EPs from 1995 to 2006, and since then has released six albums and multiple EPs and singles under his own name. David's introspective songwriting and willingness to tackle heavy personal themes in his work has garnered him fans the world over. David will be playing his raw and powerful songs at Changeville in 2017, and tickets are available at changeville.us. We're honored to have David Bazan on the show today. How are you doing today, David? I'm doing great, man. How are you doing? You know, I, I, I'll i be honest, I've been better. I had a, a, a bad hamburger, and I'm not feeling 100%, but we'll oh, do no. this. <laughs> But <laughs> I hope you feel better. <laughs> Thank you. So Changeville is all about evoking social change to better one's community. What is a social issue today that you believe needs support, and how can artists use their platform to spread awareness of that issue? Well, unfortunately, I think that we're just awash in issues <laughs> that need <laughs> artist voices, just any sane voices to speak up about rights for people of color and women and LGBT. And I mean, there's just right now, that's all I can really think of as things that need, need attention. We, we have a runaway train getting inaugurated in a week or two. And um, yeah, I just feel like it's all hands on deck time for uh, people in the United States. <laughs> Last year, you released two albums, Dark Sacred Night and Blanco, and on Blanco, uh-huh. you included the powerful song Trouble with Boys, and then you released the music video for it along with an essay by Kathleen Tarrant uh, on November 11th, which our listeners may remember as only a few days after the event you're referring to uh, occurred. Yeah. Um, and so, I mean, I watched the video, I read the essay, and was deeply moved. For our listeners who may not have seen either, can you describe what they'll find, where it came from, and what you were looking to explain? express through it since i think it very much pertains to what you're talking about here well sure um the song trouble with boys um it was where it all began and to tell you the truth like with most of the songs that i write i didn't have an idea of what i was trying to convey it just sort of came out slowly and i kind of realized well this moves me i don't know even then, I didn't really know what it was about. I might not still fully know what it's about in a concrete way. But then we put it out, and I, I played the song a bunch. And one of the things that it's about is, regardless of what the subtext is, is that we all are worthy of love. And, you know, Cornel West says that justice is what love looks like in public. And so, by extension, it's about justice and it's about people sort of being left out of things regularly enough where they feel shut out, you know, um, be it relationships or, you know, just opportunities. So it, it ended up being a song, I guess, about that. Um, and then we made a video again, not really thinking about like, what is this try? What is this saying? Just what seems like the right decisions for all of, you know, we came up with an idea for the, a girl running that seemed like it was going to work and then for my side of it we just tried to figure out something where i'm lip syncing that doesn't suck you know <laughs> i just hate lip syncing in videos in general so much and so the director friend of mine was like well are there any videos where you're happy with the lip syncing in other people's music and i said yeah tom york singing no surprises that sort of thing where there's some sort of like trick to it you know and he said okay well we just got to think of a trick and i just said okay well i could be sobbing the whole time um and he he was like you could you think you can and i said yeah i'm pretty sure that that'll work and so we just did that and then finished the video and then it kind of sat around for a minute because we were going to put it out with this movie that he and I are working on together. And um, But when Trump got elected, uh, I realized that I had sitting there 
waiting to be released. A statement to women and people of color and LGBTQ people and anybody who just felt like that with the election of Trump, their voice got a little smaller or their concerns were pushed off to the side in a way that hurt, you know. And I, so I wanted, I realized I had something that could sort of affirm to anybody who is just feeling marginalized by that event that, you know, there are those of us who don't don't feel that way. So, and then got my friend Kathleen to write something about it, or I asked her and she said, I have an idea. Is it okay if it's not your normal, like, you know, David Bazan is from Seattle, Washington <laughs> kind of press release thing. And I said, yeah, just do whatever you want. You know, I trust you. And so she wrote that. And there's a point in the little piece of hers where she characterizes something that I was saying the next morning to my family or whatever. And um, that's the only bit that I edited to get that accurate to what my sentiment was. But the rest of it was just her, whatever she wanted, you know. It turned out to be something I think, I don't know, it was helpful to me to, to do it, to put it out. And the response that we got back from people indicated that they felt what we were putting out there at that moment, you know. And yeah, and so, I, I mean, I think it still uh, still resonates. And uh, again, I, I encourage our listeners to go find it. It won't be hard. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Trouble with boys. That's that's it. So, in uh, relation to that, I mean, you mentioned the theme of being worthy of love. I think your career is is very interesting when viewed from the perspective of social change. Your work is tied to organizations like To Write Love on Her Arms because of your willingness to write songs that explore some of those darker elements of life. Mm -hmm. Um, You know, I mentioned to write love on our arms because the very first line of their story mentions Pedro the lion by name. And, uh, and I know you've done work with them in the past with their heavy and light shows and whatnot. But um, Mm -hmm. so, so, I mean, uh, many of your introspective songs resonate on a personal frequency. And I imagine that you hear stories all the time about how your work has affected people's lives. Do you have like a favorite story uh, or a story that comes to mind of how your work touched someone's life? Well, that's an interesting question. Um, I don't, off the top of my head, what I do when I, I do get people talking to me in that way um, about my songs, and because I'm a fan of music, and music has touched my life, I guess that's a cheesy way to say it, but it's nourishing, and it's, it's hope-giving, and it just, when you find a record, or an artist, or a song even, that, you know, that you get obsessed with, and it really helps you somehow, and in kind of an intangible way, but it just makes your life better, it makes your mood better. For me, the stuff that, I, that turns me on the most is stuff where you can just hear the care that people put into some aspect of the writing. There's just some indication of their love of this thing. So I have this experience with that myself, the band Bedhead, the band Fugazi, you know, the Beatles, Pavement, Gillian Welch, Julie Doran. There's just so many artists over the years whose music has been so nourishing. And so when I talk to people about it, I can share the feeling with them. It's it's odd and awe-inspiring, I guess, that I am the object of those people's strong feelings and good experiences with music. But I can accept it because I care about what I'm doing. And so whether or not it makes sense to me on a level of like, oh, I get why you think I'm awesome, because <laughs> I don't. I don't get it. But I do know how much time and energy I've put into this and how much care, and that that has translated and that somebody has received that and heard it and it's helped i can i can understand that because i've experienced it as a consumer and as a person with headphones on on a plane who just needs some a certain kind of song at that certain time or you know what i mean mhm mhm i do know what you mean because actually your album curse your branches to me means a lot uh, because my personal story kind of parallels yours in some 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 ways and was oh, soundtracked sure. by your music and i know many others for whom uh, this is true. You're in an interesting position that I that I can't really think of any other artist that finds themselves in. Uh, you came up in in an alternative Christian music subculture, but mm-hmm. you were one of the only artists in that realm speaking about doubts and questions in a real way. And uh, you know, eventually you did release "Curse Your Branches," which I mentioned, um, which mm-hmm. is described as a breakup album with God. Um, mm-hmm. A major part of the narrative around your songwriting and your career involves this connection with Christian culture, and I'd really say that you are the voice in music for those who experience doubt or a falling out with faith. 
I'm curious how you feel about this narrative on your work, because it seems like for someone who doesn't believe anymore, you still end up being asked about Christianity a lot. And I realize I'm doing it here now as well. Uh, Well, you know, I'm the one who started it, for sure, in terms of the conversation about Christianity. and, and, And I'm really the main person who keeps it going, not because I'm a believer or I'm interested in Christianity on that level, but as a somebody who grew up in Christian culture, evangelical Christian culture in America, you know, that's my native place. I mean, that's my native culture. You know, I've grown and changed, and I now there is a culture shock when I when I kind of wade into certain segments of that subculture. Um, but in general, I still, I mean, we're just all faced with. Christianity and the effects of the way that people practice Christianity in this country in a negative way constantly. You know, it's down to evangelical Christianity that Bush was president for two terms, and without evangelical Christianity, Trump would not have gotten elected. It's just a fact. Um, 81% of white evangelicals voted for Donald Trump. And so I find myself in a position to want to influence Christianity to find its true nature again. Mm -hmm. Not that I could be a believer again. Maybe I could. I don't know. It doesn't seem likely. But I know about evangelical Christianity, and I understand how they are even betraying their stated beliefs, you know. Mm -hmm. Um, And so I want to, I care, you know. Sometimes it comes out as anger because I do get angry about it. But that all flows from care, and it usually rests in a place of just wanting desperately to help people see, you know, because they'll feel they'll feel more free and at peace too. You can't you can't vote for a person like Donald Trump and then have a peaceful life after that unless you repent, you know. If there's no, <laughs> I, I do know, yeah, no peace uh, after making a blunder of that nature or or a calculated move, if that's what it was. I can't believe that most of the people, especially Christians who voted for him, actually understood what they were voting for. Yeah. The point being, um, I care and I want and I want to help. And I know that that's not welcome in a lot of circles within evangelical Christianity, but there are circles within that culture that do welcome me to have a seat at the table to talk through things. And um, so, yeah, I started the conversation, certainly. I mean, it's I've always written about it. And I'm still writing about it to some degree, although it's maybe less and less. Blanco doesn't have a strong religious footprint. I mean, the connotations of those songs do veer into that ever so slightly, but not in a way that is overt, you know. So, but yeah, I I care. I care so much about what happens. And I think that the fate of evangelical Christianity is the fate of the United States, too. So if evangelical Christianity just keeps running amok, and this goes all the way down the toilet, it just would not bode well for America, you know. Yeah. Like evangelical Christianity needs to find its soul again, and I'd love to be a part of that. You you know, you talk about evangelical Christianity as being your native place, and yes, you have, you know, walked in a different direction as, as you've grown older, but, you know, saying that you want, that you care and you want to help, Rather than being resentful, and although there's some anger that comes along with it, rather than being angry, uh, it's really meaningful personally for me to hear because, uh, you know, like I said, I went through a very similar (laughs) transition, being raised in an evangelical environment and kind of swinging the opposite end of the pendulum as I got older and more exposed to the world. Um, So I really appreciate your perspective, and I know that our listeners, some of them out there, will uh, will feel the same way. So we've discussed kind of at a broad level some of the personal issues that your songwriting tackles. How do you feel about the artist's role as being a voice for issues, whether they be spiritual, personal, or societal? The way that I approach it is I just write what comes out. I just find what's in there. You know, for instance, with Branches, I didn't want to write a record about religion again and drinking and marriage and these things that were already pretty well trod, you know, ground in my work by that point. But that was just what my body kept doing. And the songs moved me when I played them. And so that was how I knew, like, well, these are 
for you then like you got to you got to finish you know these songs and put this record out so my personal stance on that stuff is i don't feel pressure to do or not do anything sometimes i feel pressure not to write about stuff because it's so uncommon these days for people's songs to be about something i i guess societal or political or um it, i don't see it as being that common um, and so I guess I do wonder with other artists if they're avoiding that because they feel like it's in poor taste or if they're avoiding it because it's not what people want to hear. And so it's you have this innate sense of writing things that are going to be more successful or something. I'm not really sure. But to me, I just feel, it just seems like, why wouldn't you? Music is such a powerful thing. And if my body is just naturally doing something that has a political connotation to it, and if it's done well i think i should do it I, I i don't want to to give the impression that i think that people should write political songs because that's not i people should just write whatever their body is writing but i would encourage people not to shy away from i think maybe people do shy away from politics and religion and those sorts of things because i don't know why i mean i guess i do but it doesn't seem valid to me and we're also, I mean, now we're just in this fucked to death situation. And so I just, I don't know, not, I'm having a hard time conveying this because it's delicate, but we shouldn't be avoiding it. We should be learning how to, to address it tastefully in a way that is helpful. You know, people often will say, oh, well, Bob Dylan, you know, he, he did it and it's just kind of been done or whatever. And no, I don't think he did the greatest job of it, you know? He's the best songwriter that ever lived, probably. But what it, what did his political songs amount to? Everybody that knows every lyric to those Dylan songs, half of them voted for Trump. You know, mm. that's an interesting perspective on that. So the point is, is like he he did he, he tried his hand at writing political songs, found that he didn't like it. He, he he got famous doing it, but then he bolted. You know, and now he's doing Sinatra covers. <laughs> Now he's doing fucking Chrysler commercials or whatever. And what, you know, I, I, I assume he doesn't need money. I can't imagine how he would. I, my point is, is that if people think that that is the previous generation, like they tried it and it didn't really work or something, or I just feel like find different ways to do it. You know, somebody who did write about it, who I do think you can't listen to John Lennon songs without feeling that summons to like radical living, you know, his songs, his solo songs. They're all about that. <laughs> he was obsessed uh, with personal change, therapy, uh, you know, personal therapy and provocative political statements. I think a lot of where where you're seeing what you're describing today is actually in a lot of hip hop music, which is. Well, yeah, that's where it happens. Yes. Yeah. Um, well, I wanted Absolutely. to switch gears to your to your music a little bit more. Mm -hmm. So you've taken a really interesting approach to touring in the last few years. Uh, you tour traditional venues, of course, but just as often, mm -hmm. if not more often, you do house shows, uh, yep. whole tours of house shows. Uh, mm -hmm. Instead of playing clubs for hundreds of people, you're playing in someone's living room for probably at most 100 people. What made you mm -hmm. choose to pursue this direction, and, and what's the difference as a performer? I'll start by saying both club shows and house shows are fantastic. I, I've been, as you say, doing mostly club shows the last couple of years. 2015, I think, was like 100% house shows. 2016, I got back into clubs when I went out and supported Blanco. And I realized after having played so many house shows what it was that I liked about club shows. But there, there is something that I like there so i like them both so much um how i started playing house shows was in 2008 we were looking and planning for 2009 kersher branches came out in 2009 but it didn't come out till september and we had agreed with barsook our record label that i was going to lay low until branches came out because every time you go out on a club tour you're using capital or resources you know there's the weekly papers who you tend to solicit to write about the show, you know, with the promoters, you know, they're they're trying to really look and see like 
do I want to book this show? Is it going to fill up the venue? Like he came through recently or he doesn't have a new record or whatever. So they wanted me to save all those resources until the new record came out, which left me about 11 months with no income because touring, since people stopped buying records, touring is the only way to make money. Well, touring and sync licenses, um, which I have never been successful at or really tried that hard to get. And so I was left without any income. So we realized, my manager and I, that we needed to figure out a way to obey the spirit of our agreement with Barsouk, but disobey the letter of the agreement, which was (laughs) basically they don't want me touring. And we figured out a way to tour that didn't use any of those resources that just stayed under the radar and only really hit the people that were already following us on Facebook and email and whatever else, you know? So that's what I did. I did, I don't know, 80 house shows that year. And and then branches came out and then I did a bunch of club shows with the band. And by the end of that year, I just realized this is the new model for me. You know, house shows are fantastic. There's something so pure and kind of, There is definitely a, I mean, there's a DIY aspect to it where I just bring in a little rig of either just an acoustic guitar or a little amp that I'm playing electric through and just stand there and play my songs for people for 75 minutes. And then you stand around somebody's kitchen and drink a beer or stand out in the backyard and smoke a J or whatever, you know, it's, it's real, it's just homey, you know, even if it's at like a, We do them at homes and also businesses and coffee shops and art galleries and bicycle shops and whatever. And I don't know, there's just an excitement to it that you can just make a thing happen. You know, everybody in the room is like, he just said to these people, hey, can I play a show here? And they said yes, and then we're all here. Anybody can do this. It's stripped down to its essence, just playing songs, interacting with people. And there's no obstacles. There's no green room. I mean, you're just, you're exposed. And that's one of the things that's so exciting about it. I've done six or, I don't know, 600 plus (laughs) house shows since 2009. I might be pushing 700 by now. I don't know. Oh, my God. (laughs) Um, And then a bunch of club shows to boot. So, yeah, I love it. All of them are great. There's no real bad ones. That's my job to keep the energy where it's supposed to be, you know, at Mm -hmm. a a house show. But the good ones, the great ones, are just transcendent. You get to feel the feeling in the room more than a club show. I don't know. There's something removed and anonymous about when a club show goes great. Because that means there's a packed house and you can't really settle on any one group of people or it's just your attention is really scattered you know and the high is great from uh, knocking a club show out of the park i mean it's it's exquisite but you don't share it with the audience in the same way as you do at a house show that goes great because you can just reach out and high five people you know not like i'm high-fiving people at the house (laughs) shows but like theoretically i mean they're just right there with everybody and it's really exciting i love it Much of your music has, you know, fallen generally into rock, singer, songwriter styles, but with your most recent album, uh, not counting the Christmas record, uh, Blanco, you pursued a distinctly electronic sound. Uh, Where did this direction come from? I've been wanting to make music that is based on synthesizers since about the year 2000. I just got kind of this moment in a Flaming Lips song that has this like low square wave synth bass thing to it off of Soft Bullet and it just floored me. I just thought, I love that sound. I want to hear that sound all the time. I bought a synthesizer that year and I've been buying and selling synthesizers ever since. And I just am obsessed with them. I love them and I love the noises that they make and I love the ability to arrange music on a synthesizer in a way that is, I don't know, different than the guitar. And so I made a a record called Headphones in 2005, which is synthesizers and drums, like, you know, real drums. And so that was my first foray into making music and, like, releasing music with synthesizers. And since then, I've been looking for ways to incorporate them, but it just hasn't 
felt honest or I don't know. On Branches, I wanted desperately to have a lot more synthesizer stuff on there, but it just didn't fit that record. The songs wanted other things. There is some synthesis on there, but it's ornamental. It's not the fundamental part of the thing. Strange Negotiation, same thing. It just I was in a rock band with a couple of dudes that we were always out playing all these bazon tunes, and so we just decided to make a record of what we did together. So then when Blanco happened, I just got to flex that muscle again for the first time. And the collaborator that I uh, worked with on that record, Yuki Matthews, he um, has a taste for all that stuff too. So that fit really nicely together. My desire and the things that I was sending him had a lot more synthesizers on them at the at the root. You know, there was, there was a little bit of guitar on that record, but... Mostly I was just writing on synthesizer and sending it over to him, and uh, he would send things back with even more weirdness on it, you know, and uh, it made me very happy. You know, it's interesting that you say kind of the song determines the style um, or the instrumentation, because, like, I couldn't hear Kept Secrets not being done with electronics, and you know, comparatively, like you said, I couldn't hear in my mind songs from Curse Your Branches being produced with a heavier electronic bass. So uh, it's yeah. just interesting that you say that. Um, what are you listening to these days? Well, a ton of stuff. Uh, that band Broadcast is a constant favorite, constantly in rotation. The two records that I listen to the most are Tender Buttons and Ha Ha Sound. The singer and main writer from that band, is, is she died a couple, a few years ago. And kind of, I mean, she was very young. It was tragic. She made such beautiful music. And uh, this band, Proto Martyr from Detroit, their record called The Agent Intellect, the newest Angel Olsen record, My Woman, is just really great, I think. I've been listening to that a bunch, that Shut Up, Kiss Me. Uh, Hold me tight. Um, yeah. Oh, it's so good. Uh, this Chris Staples record from last year, I think he's amazing. Um, he's on Barsook also. Yeah, um, he um, he had a song, I forget the name of it, from one of his recent albums about um, you know his, his relationship, I think, with his son. And, and I sing that to uh, my daughter, so I, I, I feel you on that one. Is it that uh, I want to love you? Yes. I want to pass it. God damn, that song is good. <laughs> oh, man. Oh, man. I saw, so he came team. through Gainesville um, a year or two ago, and I, and I caught his show, and, and I, I couldn't help but uh, shed a couple tears there. Oh, it's a beautiful song. So, so beautiful. He has a new one called The Golden Age. So that's on the previous record, and then he cranked out The Golden Age quick. And, uh, I don't know that I've, I guess, I've heard it. I'll have to check it out, as will our listeners. Yeah, The Golden Age, it's, it's really great. It really, if you like the uh, that song and the record that it came from, which is called American... Uh, I forget what that record's <laughs> called. Um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to put in a, like a little edit note here when I, whenever I look it up after this is over. Editor's note, I'm editing this in afterwards the album that we're both referring to is called american soft uh but that's a great record golden age is even better i think uh and the the cover art is just really simple and amazing i love it um so yeah those those are some things i've been listening to what projects are you working on right now i'm in a band called low tom l-o space t-o-m is how you spell it um and that's with Tim Walsh, uh, Jason Martin, and Trey Manny. Trey was in Pedro. He's been my booking agent for uh, 20 years almost. And Tim and I were in Pedro together, too. Uh, Jason Martin has a band called Starflyer 59 that people might be aware of. That um, So the four of us have, like, a rock band. And it looks like the record's going to come out in June. That's what it's currently slated for. That'll be out on Barsook. Probably I'm going to put out a record in a couple of weeks on the 22nd. That's what I'm working on today. It's looking like I'm going to I'm going to make it. So, um, well, you heard it here first, folks. This will be out on the 20th. Ah, cool. Well, um, yeah, it could. Either way, I think we're going to announce on the 22nd. But there, it it might be 
I think we're just going to put it out. So uh, there's a couple of things that could stand in the way of that happening. But um, either way, in the next month or so, there's going to be a new Bazan record out. Well, um, that's exciting. <laughs> I'm glad I get to hear it from the source. Yeah, I'm excited too, man. Uh, I think there's some good songs. Um, this one so far is going to be just me playing guitar and singing, which I've never done. There might be some drum machines and some light, like other stuff, but it's going to be based on me singing and playing these tunes um, solo. And um, I don't know. I'm excited. It's it's a little scary. I've never done that, as I just said, but um, I think it's going to be pretty cool. Before we wrap this up, uh, I have a question I ask all of our guests. What one song do you think everyone needs to hear and why? The song that comes to my mind, and I'm sure later I'll think of another one that I think is, oh, well, now my, the net is cat, is widening. <laughs> um, the song that I was thinking of was this, this the last song on this Gillian Welch record called uh, Time the Revelator. That's the name of the record. The song is called I Dream a Highway. And I think it's like 17 minutes. It's basically a folk song with like 100 verses. And when it stops, I don't want it to stop, usually. The lyrics are so sweet, and it just puts you... It, it's a great record for winter, a great record for summer nights. If you're driving, and it's kind of wet out. I don't know. That, that, that song, I Dream a Highway, is, um, it's, a, it's, a, it's an achievement. It's really just so beautiful. Well, I know that I'm going to listen to that on the way home <laughs> from the studio today. It and might out, last the my whole, whole, the whole drive. Record, Time the Revelator 2, I just couldn't recommend more. It's one of the top, my top ten records of all time, Time the Revelator. Absolutely. Um, Thank you. Thank you so much to our guest, David Bazan. We'll be back in a couple of weeks with another episode of the Changeville podcast. Until then, check out our website or Facebook page. Our lineup is out now and includes Talib Kweli performing with a full band, Big Frida, Amy Ray of the Indigo Girls, Moon Hooch, Big Sam's Funky Nation, and of course, David. We just released single show tickets in addition to multi-venue passes, so if you wanted to just see David, you can buy a ticket to see just his show. Multi-venue passes get you access to all Changeville shows. Until next time, this is Brandon, signing out.